You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Please remember that subscribing to our podcast on iTunes is the best way to support our show. Those that are already subscribers, we thank you. And those of you who aren't, we thank you in advance. We know you'll be going and doing the deed soon. Today we're going to be talking turkey and not the denuded shrink wrap birds you buy at Stop and Shop. Turkeys aside, buntings, grosbeaks, sandpipers, seagulls, eagles, owls, and grackles. In other words, we're going to be talking about bird photography. We have two guests this week. David Spizer is a member of the board of directors of the New York City Audubon. He's traveled the world and the five boroughs of greater New York City photographing birds, and his impressive archive of images can be found at lilybirds.com. We'll give you the spelling and the links later. Clemens Gasser is a visual artist, photographer, and birder. He has published three books in addition to producing several gallery shows and his series, There Will Be Without You, in which birds are the primary subject, has been exhibited most recently at the Gilded Owl Gallery in Hudson, New York. Welcome to both of you. Uh, We're going to start our show talking about each of our guests' personal styles and approaches to bird photography. Then we'll take a short break and we'll talk about gear, technique, and locations for taking great bird photographs. And if we have the time, I have a few good chicken recipes handed out from my grandmother on my mother's side. Before we sally forth, it's time for Al's Gearhead Pick of the Week. Today's show is about birding, and wouldn't you know it, B&H sells a drone that not only looks like a bird, but flies like a bird. The XTIM Bionic Bird Drone is three inches long and weighs three ounces. It has a range of 328 feet and can buzz your neighbor's cat at speeds up to hunt up <laughs> at speeds of up to 12 miles an hour. Flight time is about eight minutes, and you could resume terrifying your neighbor's cat in as little as 12 minutes by simply connecting it to the included power egg, which, which can charge your bird for a total of a dozen flights. It's priced at a little bit over $100 and looks like a ton of fun to fly. Does it have a camera? No, it doesn't have a camera. <laughs> it doesn't, but it's okay. It, it's, it's, it's a little bird that you can scare yeah, people. Yeah, I've seen it. That's pretty cool. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, welcome, everybody. I, I got to ask a question. What makes a good bird photograph? A good bird photograph? Well, it's really in the eye of the beholder. But as the photographer, you have a preconceived notion of what you want the, the image to be like before you shoot it, or at least, at least I do. So I kind of picture, if I'm going out on a day to shoot, let's say, a, a yellow warbler, for example... I I have an image in my mind that I would like the bird perched on a nice nice perch with flowers and maybe a nice clear background where I can isolate the subject. And how do you communicate that to the bird? <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's really the hardest part. Yeah. Um, it, it, it requires a lot of patience um, knowing where the birds are located, where they breed, for example. Um, if, if that's the – you want a singing bird, you probably want it during breeding time where they're singing early in the morning. Ah. So, you have, so you have to get out, um, and it's just years of experience of knowing where, where they are and then luck. And um, so, for example, in this case, is getting the bird singing the goal, getting it, it's kind of in, in, its prime, in, right, in, in most this, visual activity? In, in this specific, if that was what I was, I was going for. But I think for, for the viewer, you're, you're trying to just really create an, an aesthetically pleasing picture with not too many distractions. You kind of want to give the, the bird human qualities in a way. So you, you, you want to be able to make good eye contact with the bird. So the viewer should be able to, to see the eye of of the bird and not be distracted by twigs, branches, fire engine. <laughs> no, uh, no, that, that actually is a pretty Clemens, I have a feeling be- you may have a different <laughs> take, but we'll get to that. I, 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 you know, isolating your subject or not isolating your subject, because when you're doing birds, quite often they are in trees. They're in very complicated, distracting environments. environments. They're not clean shots per se. Right. I think it's a bit different between art, which can screw up, can do bad photos, right? Artists do bad stuff all the time and they fail. And bird photography has a craft. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, first of all, you want to get close to the bird and and have detail, right? Isolate it somehow from the background so you see the bird, have maybe some action. So these are all things I don't care so much for my own photos, but I think for 
and it's a craft also to handle the, the machinery, the equipment, heavy lands and stuff like that. So, well, to get back to the the original point, I, I would say I, I like to try to create most of my images with an eye level uh, approach. So you're you're looking straight on at the bird. If you're looking up at it and you have an up angle, it's it's not very it's not very pleasing, um, and it's more intimate when it's when it's right on. Like if you're shooting a duck. And you get right on the plane of where the where, where the duck is. It, it really it draws the viewer in. Um, and I would say that there's you know there are many different styles when you're when you're shooting birds or you're professionally shooting birds. Um, sometimes you might feel like the environment is so pretty or or so special it really draws you in that you want to draw the viewer into the whole experience. So you might want to have the bird a little bit smaller in the frame and include more of the environment. Let's say you know you're on the tundra and you want to have tundra grasses, or the birds in a beautiful bush, and you want to include the whole, the whole bush and and the flowers. And then there are other times where, for whatever reason, you feel like shooting a portrait of the bird, where you can really get a lot of detail. Um, so kind of like a headshot. And and sometimes that just comes about because the bird gets too close and you have too big a lens, or it's something that you're actually striving for. Um, so I, I I would say that. In terms of, and then you have, you know, if you're lucky, you get the the incredible action shot, which that really draws most viewers in the most. So I, I would say if you have a bird that's flying, or a parent feeding the young, um, or birds chasing one another, um, wings up. Th those are, you know, the action shots. I think draw the viewer in more so than. Um, just a straight bird on a stick. I imagine that also it's the personality of, or, the, or the temperaments of the birds. I mean, I have a feeder in my in my yard, um, and I know that there are some birds you could get within a few feet of the feeder, and then and they're fine. Yet I know down, but there's a river near me, and yet there are gray herons. You can't get within three hundred yards of them. They spot you and take off. You know, it, it, it's it's truly incredible. I've been doing, I've been taking pictures for as long as I've been birding, so over twenty years. Um, and there are some birds that are like that. They're, you know, you might be after that one great blue heron for, for your whole life, and every time you walk up to it, they fly away. Oh, yeah. And then all of a sudden, there's just that one magnificent moment where you get that one bird that sticks, and, and that's when you get the photo ops. I, I, I've had that with, let's say, a belted kingfisher, which is a fa fantastic bird. Um, You've also had problems with belted kingfishers. Always, huh? I tell you, they drive me nuts. But <laughs> no, if, no, <laughs> my experience of, of, of shooting birds is clay pigeons. That's as close as I got. It, it's so. their big heads. What, what, what can you do? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you mentioned the birding aspect in relation to the photography. Are they intrinsically linked for you, or for, for me, they are. You're right. A lot of people um, can't do both. Right. Some can do both part time. Mm -hmm. But for, for me, I was a birder first, and I think it enhanced my photography. You learn the behaviors of the birds, where they're located, how, how they act, and, and you could kind of predict. But when I'm looking in the viewfinder, and you know, with a, with a large lens, you have a very uh, small field of view. But when the bird flits off, to, to stay on it is, is kind of an art. Mm -hmm. And just from years of watching birds, I can move my camera with the bird's movement and, and kind of keep it in the frame. And, and that allows you many times to catch moments that you would never catch before because, you know, if, if they're flying off to go get a worm or go feed their young, if you can't stay on them, you, you'll, you'll never get it. It's, it's like a second or a tenth of a second to, to stay Do on Do either one of you go back to pre-autofocus days because that was the fun time to shoot birds? Anybody here? Or? Of course. I started off with... Uh, with a, with a lens I bought at B&H in probably 1995 when you guys were still on 17th Street or 19th yeah, Street, yeah, whatever yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. It was like a 1 to 500 Rokinar or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. To totally, totally <laughs> autofocus. And I took my first first bird pictures with, with, with that. And it was extremely challenging. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and <laughs> I mean, we, we haven't bro broached that subject yet, but for many years I always carried my camera with me and it was film or, or slides of wherever I traveled to. And it just wasn't that fun to take to take the pictures. I mean, it was tedious. I, I had a, at this point, it was an autofocus camera, an autofocus lens, but it was, it was difficult. And I kind of lost interest in between, let's say, 2001 to 2005. And then 
digital photography finally, with the the Canon 20D, finally reached the the point where the quality was better than film or slides, and it was just so much more fun. And so I would say starting in 2005, I was reinvigorated as, as a bird photographer, um, where I carried my, I never used to carry my camera into Central Park. I always just birded. But as soon as I, as soon as I went digital, I, I, I completely. Um, so you continued looking for birds, but you just didn't have a camera with you. So you're a, bird, you're a birder at heart, whether you have a camera or not. I bird everywhere. Okay. <laughs> and the okay. goal for a birder is simply to see the bird and, and be able to clearly identify it. Clearly and, identify it and write There it is some issues too with the, for a birder, if you don't have a camera, you can't prove your sighting. So if you see a rare bird, and even if you recognize as a good birder, Right. It's uh, still better you have a photo to yeah, show that you yeah, saw that yeah. bird. So it's kind of, it's almost like at least a 7D with a, with a 400 millimeter uh, 5.6 lens. At least that, right? At least that is kind of almost like you put it on the side and you carry it around. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a bird necessity, I would yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. And Did, most birders do that, yeah. right? It's, it's, times have changed. Every, mm. every birder has a camera now and right. every birder thinks they're a photographer. That was not always the case. I mean, no. I, I know the parks, by me, there's always people trundling around with, you know, the jungle hats and binoculars and taking notes. I see them, right. you know, spotting stuff, especially this time of year. We're in migratory season. Again. Correct. In fact, what are you guys doing? You should be out there. The birds are migrating. Hmm. And what do the old school birders <laughs> say when, I mean, if they didn't used to carry cameras around, is there any kind of conflict between uh, the, the photographer and the birder? It's constant conflict. Oh, yeah? Yeah, tell me about it. Well, it, birders think photographers get too close and scare scare the birds away, and photographers think the same. Okay. Birders, but <laughs> I don't know. I see some of those people, you know, traipsing around the woods with those big floppy hands and binoculars. They're pretty intimidating too. No. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> They're but not no, scaring the birds? No, of course they do. And the thing is, <laughs> birders move in packs. Right. So yeah. where a photographer most of the time is a lone wolf, or you might have one or two buddies with you, a, a birder could be 30 or 40 people in, in Central Park. And what, what are, you know, if you're a little three-inch bird, what are you going to do when you see those floppy hats coming at you? Now I you, know what I would do. <laughs> now you guys shoot in, the, in city environments a lot. Do you find a difference between birds from the cities and out in the country? Uh, seriously, I mean, oh. uh, obviously, I mean, animals are a lot more used to having us around in the city, but what about when you go away? You see, it's totally different um, because we're basically seeing the birds during migration in, in the city parks. So... Um, they have one mission, and that is to feed and get out of here. So they don't. That's they, why we. I, I do that five days a week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I feed, but don't get out of here. But, <laughs> but, but really, the the birds become don't care as much about the distractions of of people when they have one thing in their mind, and that's to to, to fatten up so I can get out of here, either get warm or or go have babies. So. Um, that, that's my experience for years of birding in the parks. Yeah, my thing was that uh, I tried to, to limit myself. My birds are all photographed in Brooklyn, right? All of them, right. so there's no exception. Yeah, and Brooklyn is a uh, right, city, has a lot of coast, so it's it's mostly Prospect Park or Floyd Bennett Field or Plum Beach. Uh -huh. Floyd Bennett and Field. And there yeah. is a, there is often yeah. a, a, city, how is, a city pigeon. How next is to New York considered Gallo. for bird? Is it a good city for birders, given its location and the fact that there are some this coast and green. It's or? great. It's yeah. being aged by material. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. There, right? there, it's great. there are many habitats and many parks, and I mean it, it's been said many times. But if you're a migrating bird and you're flying from five thousand feet and you're tired and you're looking down for a patch of green and you see Central Park or Prospect Park, it's it's an easy it's mm. an easy land for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's so. That's why the city parks are kind of an attraction for birds and what it makes it such a good place for bird watching. And what time of year? When when will you see the most people in Prospect Park doing this? I would say, obviously, the, the peaks is always migration. My thing is I, I like it better when it's overcast and cold and wintry and there's nobody around. So I do mostly, or I did mostly birding in the in the winter. And I also like the winter birds, the gulls or, or some stuff like that, so, so white-winged gulls. So, so I, uh, but the... When everybody gets out, it's like in May or in uh, fall a bit longer, and you see the birds passing by. But for the for the gray guys who like gray birds and 
as you say, seagulls, which is a, mm-hmm. a crime because you have to say gals in birding and community. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Always, I would. Oh, I correct. I correct my daughters all the time when they say seagulls. <laughs> it's gulls. <laughs> <laughs> and now, David, do you do you plan trips around? You're birding. Do you go? Where have you been? Oh, yeah. And 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 how's um, that work? Well, in my birding days, soul birding days, pre pre children, I traveled to six continents, and the goal was to see as many birds as as possible. So, um, yeah, I would I would come up with a list of birds. I would find a, a a local guide and go away for a week or two just with the guide, and all we would do is bird. So from five thirty to in the morning till six thirty at night. Have yeah. you ever stalked that giant woodpecker down in Mississippi or Alabama? What's the, which, which one the, is that? The ivory-billed woodpecker. Yes, the holy grail bird or something like yeah, that? Yeah, if, <laughs> if, if it really was there, I would be there. But <laughs> there, there's a, you know, there's a lot of a lot of debate on whether it's really been seen. Really? That it, oh, okay. Even, I thought it's been confirmed. Even Cornell at this point is, is kind of not fully behind it anymore. Oh, so the, the, they, you know, I better cancel my trip. I was going to be yeah, going next week. It, it's very pleasant. A lot of the mosquitoes are very nice this time. Oh, here. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do either one of you ever? Uh, we're, we're talking about in New York City, and New York has a lot of waterways. Do you ever go out on the water to photograph birds? Because I know, I know of one friend. He used to he goes around the Meadowlands yeah. a lot. Uh, there is the there is the pelagic trips with Pelagic, for example, does trips from out of Sheepshead Bay. Yeah. And for example, in my case, I cheated on two birds which are kind of 20 miles out, photographed, and they are on a boat it's called Brooklyn, so it's, it's still a Brooklyn <laughs> bird. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, one, the best way to go out on the water is kind of go on a pelagic trip and to kind of do it from, from Brooklyn. It's wonderful. And you can see pelagic birds. And, and pelagic birds are birds that only live on, on the water. They don't come. Uh-huh. So some, they might breed on rocky out, outcrops in the middle of the water. But um, What are some of those birds? Shearwaters, um... Jaegers, skewers, Jaegers, skewers, but also some gulls. Fulmers, um, but gulls you'll find a lot closer in. Um, yeah. So they're, they're specialty birds, and the albatross most people have heard of. So they have, they basically have long tapered wings. for, mm-hmm. for They fly thousands of miles. These so days. in order to get like the shot you were describing where you want that angle, you know, an eye-level angle or straight, do you spend a lot of time looking for that perfect spot and setting up, or are you constantly on the move? For me, those specific shots um, will probably occur in the spring where, when the birds are singing so I can locate them. It requires lots of time. Um, yeah, you mentioned when the birds sing. We're doing still photographs, not video. So the posture of the birds is different in the spring as it would be in other times of year when they're not breeding. Is that what you're – that's what I'm gathering from this. Well, yeah, well, when they sing, they're, they're, they're definitely more upright and they throw their heads back and, and, th- and things like that. And More English in their form. Okay. De- definitely. And, 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 but but they're, they're doing many things during, during – while they're setting up in, on their breeding territories. I mean they're, they're setting up their territories. They're looking for food. They're chasing off predators. Are they also more colorful that time of year? The, some species? Or some male of uh, – maybe I think the males the, in particular, right? The males – some – some males change um, in the fall to more bland, and some stay the same. But but you know, colorful like a yellow warbler um, male will probably be a yellow warbler male. Well, that's not, I won't use him. A black throated blue male warbler will look the same in the fall and the spring, but a chestnut sided warbler will will look completely different. It will be colorful in the spring and not in the fall. It's and, around here, it's black and white all year round, it seems, in this environment. Pretty much. Yeah. Same with the black and white warbler. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, uh, is, do you return to try to get the same bird, or not the exact same bird, but the same species again and again, or well, get a better shot? Well, or is, right. What's the goal? You know? Well, well that, 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 you never have the perfect shot, uh-huh. but you can have shots that satisfy you. Right. So for, for me, I and mean, Clemens, it might be different, obviously, but I like singing birds and birds with food. So that's that's kind of what what I'm I'm after these days with with small songbirds, um, with with raptors or bigger birds. Uh, I like to to get them in flight or with nice backgrounds, um, foliage. Yeah, so it can require many trips to the same spot. It can require you might find I'll use a yellow warbler here again. You find millions of yellow warblers here on the East Coast and around New York City. But if you travel out to North Dakota, you'll find them in kind of different environments, and they might be doing different things. So. If I have a trip to, let's say, I'll use North Dakota again as an example, I'll have a target list of species that I would like to try to shoot. And then you do a lot of research. You can email people, 
there's tons, tons of information on the internet, plenty of birding books. And you go around and you try to find the birds. And if you get the shot you want, you're, you're satisfied and you move on. To another bird. To another, another species, bird. Right? Then I'll move on right. to another species. Right. It's, it's, and if another bird that pops in that gives you a good op, you, you don't turn that away, just mm -hmm. like anything right. else. So right. you, you, you always shoot what's there, but kind of I'm focused on. And is, is an inventory like a checklist part of the goal to get as many different birds as possible or do you prefer to have one or two great photos of, of the same bird? I, I, I prefer to have one or two great photos of a bird but at the same time increase my library so I can move on from species to species. Is it safe to assume that you have little lists either one of you of like like right now so we're in migratory season it's October um, that birds you might be looking for having your eye out for? In my case it was really in this, I, I bird a bit less right now, although I go sometimes, but at, during these three years, it became like, a, I went all the time. So I didn't really, like, obviously you have a target bird sometimes, or you or you chase a bird, right? There's a report on Twitter, or in Brooklyn, it's a very tight-knit community there. Everybody knows everything. There's tweets, and there is a, a WhatsApp list, and there's kind of, and then you run, right? There's a whatever, it's some kind of a flycatcher <laughs> there. Everybody runs, for five minutes okay. later, there's 20 people. One of the bad things of bird photographers, us, right? It's like that if you photograph, you love it. You have this continuous shot. Then you don't photograph and you go somewhere, there's a bird. <laughs> Next to you is a guy who photographs. Tuck, 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 tuck. This, this continuous shutter is like a background for nature. It's kind of terrible if you don't photograph yourself. Once right. you do it yourself, it's kind of exciting. It's like hunting or something, right? My photos don't try to be not, they're never action, so they're kind of more overcast skies, kind of pale grayish birds. And also like these birds are communal, they are all together, right? But I like the bird alone, maybe a little bit alert, a little bit stretched out, maybe a bit thinner than it is. So it's kind of a bit artificial. So I, and I did it a few days till I got my, my photo, which I liked. And so that's, so it's, so it's kind of, I'm not so into completeness, which is a nice thing to do, but so I don't, I care about just, they're very arbitrary as an artist. Your art and your photography has taken many forms. It's not just bird photography. Did you come to it as a birder, or how did you get to, to this? To start with, I'm a yeah. bad photographer, okay. really. I always right. like, give me an iPhone and I will make the worst photograph of anybody <laughs> in the room. It, it really happened that at one point, so I, I was an artist when I was a kid and stuff, and then I gave up on that, and then I went back to being an artist. And at one point, I started birding, but in 2013, but like, like, like a drug, like crazy, right? Like, let, drop everything else and just go birding. It became such a dominant thing in my life that then the, then the photograph started too. I bought a lens before, I bought a camera, and then and then I it just became so important for me personally that I I needed to do these photographs. Mm -hmm. And it was so it was kind of birding first and then photograph. So when you looked at the photos that you've taken and decided to edit together for a, a gallery exhibit that, or a book, that's what, another thing. So what the were thing you is looking like, for? Like so I have these rules, right? So first of all. No Photoshop whatsoever, not even cropping. So none of my photos is even cropped, which is obviously, it makes sense to do if you want the result, but I said, it is to be reality. So nothing is going to be changed. The photos are all non-retouched, non-cropped, non-nothing. And then I shoot like, I shoot the hell out of it, right? So I just, when I, I try to get as close as I can and I shoot as much as I can. And usually I want like very soft sh shadows and stuff and overcast skies and I want the bird who is very, very primitively frontal or sideways, more like a kind of an Egyptian sculpture. So I want something that's not, so there's never action, there's never anything very interesting happening. It's kind of, kind of, let's say, boring, not, not very saturated. So, my, so I want the great equipment, the good thing, and then everything to make it right. My settings are all kind of, I don't like to see, like, it's good to have the great equipment to have some sharpness, but I do all, everything handheld, right? And then I try to have little light, which is when it's overcast anyhow. And so, so usually, if you have, have a 300 millimeter lens, two times extend or 800 millimeter lens, you try to have one 800 for one 600 of of of, of, of ex exposure time. In my case, I try to have 100, which is kind of of 10 photos all are shaky except for one, and then still the one is a bit shaky. So I like I like, like almost like a birding book illustration where you don't see the details too much. And what do the other bird photographers say when they hear all the stuff that you're saying right now? <laughs> I, you know, I think that that's kind of it's a the bird photography uh, environment is uh, is not so much about art. It's about bird photography. Mm -hmm. and many people might say they are artists and stuff, mm -hmm. but they, sure. they are not somehow. It's not even a problem. 
So I think that they find my photos kind of boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. the question is, do art art lovers or art people find my photographs more interesting, which I don't know either. But anyway, it's kind of very close to what, what bird photography is. It looks very similar to other mm -hmm. things you see. But I think it's it's something... It's kind of just my what, what I love. Well, I remember when I saw your the exhibit over in Chelsea, and I I kind of went through what you're explaining now. At first, I was like, "Wait a second, what's what's going on here?" And then, but with the size of the images and some of the interaction, and certainly the environment that was created around the birds, yeah. even a bird that was flying away, and all you're seeing is its tail, it it took a bit, but I got into it. You know, and I found yeah. that they were size effective. helps yeah. to make it look serious, but yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody photograph birds in black and white? I only I. I just off the top of my head, I only think of color because birds are traditionally colorful. And I think that's trying, one of the things you're trying to capture about them is the palette of color. Is, has anybody ever just struck to black and white, which would be a tough one to do? Um, some, I've seen it. I I have a couple of shots that are monochromatic, kind of, just just the color of the eyes. Uh-huh, um, Okay. Um, that would be challenging, I would assume, if you just want to limit yourself there, then you really got to... Well, that, it just it just <clears throat> happened that way while it was processing that the picture was, was taking a great gray owl, which is a large bird, probably yeah, yeah, yeah. three feet tall, in Minnesota, in, in, and it was uh, snowing. And what happened was the, the camera, which I've noticed that the Canons tend to do, is uh, especially with certain whites, is they, they have a blue cast. So the the picture wound up turning out to be quite bluish. So in order to remove the blue, it kind of turned it into to black and white-ish. Mm -hmm. But the yellow eyes of the bird still stayed. And it happens to be one of my favorite images that I've taken. So I, 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 I can see black and white as being a powerful medium for, for um, certain shots. But like you said, the birds are colorful and you kind of, you want, you want to show that off. So in certain settings, it's it's it could be very effective. It's like seeing a stunning sunset. And saying, I'm going to shoot this in triax. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, now if but you, you can if you, capture the texture of the clouds, and, and if you can pull it off, you got yourself. You're good. Right. <laughs> and and the same with bird. I mean, I, I can see it more black and white when you're trying to capture textures of, of feathers. Let's, let's say you're just taking a, a close up of or macro. And David, what's the uh, most rare bird you photographed? Or what's one that you've, yeah, you've you know, sought out after in years at, and finally got? At, 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 at this point, most of the rare birds that I've seen aren't in the United States. And at that point, it wasn't really as serious. Um, but to me, at this point, it, the, the rare birds are the ones that come from the West Coast and come over to the East Coast and that, that we see during, so we call those vagrants. So cer certain birds would be like uh, that, that have shown up that I've gotten good pictures of in the past few years. Uh, a Grace's warbler, which is found in Arizona, or fork-tailed flycatcher that was in Connecticut a couple of years ago that's, you know, from Central America. Um, so for, for me, the, the, the Pacific Slope flycatcher showed up in Central Park a couple of years ago, and that's from California. So for me, those are kind of the rare birds. And did you find out about that in one of the birding networks? In, yeah, in pre pretty much birding yeah, networks. Yeah. And, and as far as like, regular breeding birds that I've been after for years was uh, a spruce grouse, which is a bird that you find in the boreal forests of, of this country and, and, and Canada. And finally, a couple of years ago, um, I, I caught up with a female, and that was a very, very happy moment for me. So now, I want to say my bird too. Yeah, please, yeah. Please, yeah. please, 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 please. <laughs> yes, we want to I'm know. I'm not yes. nearly as good as our best birders in Brooklyn, but I have one. Which is, uh, yeah. Again, uh, <laughs> it's a common bird somewhere else in Florida, but not common here. So I had the first sighting for Kings County for a white ibis fly over <laughs> Prospect Park. So that oh. was, that's my rarest bird. Oh, <laughs> very local, very common bird. Hundred, a few hundred miles down, but that was and very are these, exciting. Have these birds just gotten lost? Is that what's going on? Yeah. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, well, they are young. They want to see something else. Yeah, most they want to travel the world, right? <laughs> most, many are young. Many want to see New York. It, if it's not if it's not storm related, um, yeah, it's another big thing. Storms are taking a lot right. Of these birds like over, like huh? for for example, there's a brown booby out in um out east on um, eastern Long Island, and that was probably brought up by um, one of the the storms. That's a bird that you find in southern environs, mm -hmm. right? Caribbean and things like that. So you know, why is it here? But so the the storm. And as Clemens mentioned, most of the most of the stray birds that we see are usually younger birds that don't get the prime territory, or somehow they get lost on 
wind, headwinds. Well, also, winds, like if they're like Amish when they're 16, they're thrown out of the house they for one totally year. They totally thrown out. And you come back after your first year. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's, that's basically true, though. <laughs> In that, the bird world too. Yeah, yeah really. The, yeah, and it, it happens in the animal world. That you know, the animal world, mammals <laughs> do it, birds do it. It's you know? a tough. It's a tough life. It's, Migration is a pain in the neck. It's really bad. <laughs> it sounds so for great. People like, oh, migrating, right? flying. <laughs> it's kind right. of. And after seven, seven years, most birds are dead. It's like <laughs> yeah. it's a tough. It's a, they're yeah. beautiful, but it's a tough it life. So Interesting. Yeah. I still want to be a human. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're right. We picture this idea of them just you know on this incredible vacation down south or up north. But obviously, then you cross uh, the water and the <laughs> wind blows in your face. Say, holy right. shit! Should I go back over? Yeah, right. uh, and the moon is coming. And all so the time, like, there's a bigger bird or a bigger animal looking to eat you. So there you go. I mean, That's yeah. an interesting thing because I I always when I when I don't see any raptors, I always think, imagine it would be a small bird. And they always look up. They always turn right, left, look up. Say, imagine you're a small bird. And I realize I had no chance against a peregrine falcon whatsoever. If birds would be like five times the size, they would eat us. <laughs> oh, <okay>. <laughs> no <laughs> question. There's no chance yeah. to see it coming. It's like this. You, right. you, can, you can just. You well, can, it's the same thing with most animals. I mean, correct. a good friend of mine saw because I, we were talking about cats, and I have a cat that I really like. He goes, you just remember, if that cat was 350 pounds, you'd be lunch. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Only dogs. Yeah, that's maybe. a lot. That's a dogs, lion. I have a dog. <laughs> dogs might be nice, still big. Some dogs. Maybe the, maybe dogs will I have a poodle. Be, oh. I bring him to Burley, which is not very well seen sometimes. I have him on my side. So people don't like... David, can you tell us a bit uh, about the, the Audubon, <clears throat> NYC Audubon, and the relationship to the, sure. the, the society and um, what you do with them? Well, I've, I was on the, I'm currently on the board of directors of New York City Audubon. I was executive vice president of the organization for about four years. And I've been with the organization for, this is my 10th year. So New York City Audubon is a, is a, is a great group where we're there to try to connect New York City people, its inhabitants, to the natural world, to understand that there's nature out there in, in the urban environment. So it's not just about birds. It's, it's making, birds are the conduit to making the connection to the natural world. Mm. And I think that's New York City Audubon's mission. So we offer plenty of field trips um, to, to kind of back that up. And then we have a conservation staff that, that does more directed scientific work to try to help preserve birds in, in, in this tough environment. Have any birds made a, a comeback in New York City? Some, some... Oh, of course. The yeah. peregrine falcon right. would, would be one, a red-tailed hawk. Um, th those would probably be the, the, the two that I can think of. Mo most of the other birds that breed here are under a lot of pressure. And some are well, really eagles. changing, right? Like royal terns. There's all over the, royal tern was a sensation 10 years ago. It's like they're all over the place. There was like 60 royal terns of Plum Beach like a few days ago there. Some birds are really moving up more, right? Well, the eagles are changed. becoming very common also along the Hudson right now. I Correct. have them down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm off the river. Well, the eagles river are in Brooklyn there. too. Yeah. Now you see, we see like 10 a year. Before it was like maybe one a year. Uh, a raven, for example, uh -huh. is has breeds in the five boroughs now. So um, these are things that haven't happened in the past, but still the small songbirds, um, passerins, mm -hmm. Parts this, of Brooklyn have those large green parakeets, too. Yeah, the monk parakeets. Mm -hmm. Yes, which are not exactly fun birds to have in your no, neighborhood. No, they no. do crazy things to the <laughs> power lines yes, and things do. like that. And is some of this due to efforts of the Audubon Society and other conservation organizations, or would you say it's just a natural cycle I, or I think, a realization? I think, I think with the, the peregrines, for example, they, they were federally endangered, mm -hmm. and that helped the populations everywhere. So... And the banning of DDT and th things like that, that allowed the larger birds the opportunity to, to re-colonize um, certain areas. You, know, you mentioned DDT. I, I'm, a lot of our listeners, young ones, may not understand the connection. DDT is a pesticide mm -hmm. that was very commonly used. And a side effect they found that afterwards is that it thinned the shells of eggs. Correct. So a bird would lay an egg, sit on it, and literally just, it would just crush. And they, that was the problem. They stopped the use of it. Right. And a lot of birds made a comeback, but we, we, we I don't know if we actually lost anything, but we came very close to losing several species of real special right. birds. Right, and one of them was the, per, the peregrine falcon. Correct. That's probably yeah. made the, the biggest comeback. In eagle. I think it starts at the top of the food chain. So th those are, you know, the A1 predators. Mm -hmm. And so if if the DDT isn't in the, in the food chain, I think um, they have better chances of survival. But, but as I said, the, s the smaller birds are under a tremendous amount of 
pressure from development and um, that, that's overpopulation and things like that. All is another thing for everybody to know is that's where you split the borders from the photo photographers because it's a it's a crime to go too close to an owl as a photographer. And, and a birder wants to see a bird and check it off. And the photographer wants always to go close. So there's mm. a real conflict for owls. Mm. So I did snowy owls one time and then I'm not touching owls anymore. I'm not going close yeah. to any owl. owls. Are, owls are a divisive um, bird in the... Why? Be, be, I, they're, they're so great, you know? They're, they're like mythological throughout history. Mm -hmm. So people have always been gra gravitated towards them. Um, and I think a lot of the owls that we have are visiting. So, so birders and photographer people just think that they're under, that they're under a lot of stress, um, especially if they're disturbed during the day while they're trying to, to roost and get their energy up. So people become very protective of these. I mean, they're so great looking. So the, some people say, just just leave them alone. Just, don't don't photograph them. Don't go to their area. Yeah. Right, Same but, for for bre right for for nest. Uh -huh. yeah. Right. Also, yeah. like, don't don't shoot any photos. The thing is, like, really, you're tempted to get close, right? And then the easiest ones are an owl which sits around there, and there's a nest, right? So, but it's really there's kind there's there's kind of ethics, which is kind of yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and as a photographer, you're kind of like a paparazzi sometimes. You sure. kind of don't give a shit for edits, and, but you just want your shot, which is, anyway, who cares about your shot at the end? So you, you really should think about what you're doing. So right, it's, it's but, nice but as a member of New York City Audubon and as an ethical photographer, I often um, tell people in the field, you know, you're too close or you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do that. Some people take it well and other people don't. So you have to... Have you ever passed on a photo? Or on when you see, you go, you know what, I, I just... Don't want to get any closer. I'm not going to get that oh, shot and walk away. Yeah, that ha that happens. Yeah. But you usually that happens when there are 40 other photographers there, and I just like it's just not worth it. It's too much. But there's yeah. too much. You know, it doesn't need me there as well. And Clemens, do you shoot by yourself usually, or with? Oh, no, I'm a or? total. I go with people. Sometimes I'm a total loner. The uh -huh. problem there's a problem for me is like, I although it's city, but it's still park and nature. I like to be. You tend to chat if you're with somebody. Yeah. So you walk around and you start talking about this and that. It's interesting, but I, I like to walk around the whole day without saying a word. And then if I had to order a sandwich, I don't know how to speak anymore. <laughs> 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 I, I love to be I love to be alone. It's like a, I remember like some even in areas like like Coney Island Creek Park, which uh -huh. is like there's like the tall buildings behind it, and then I walk in the winter. It started hailing at one point. And walk around for the especially when it's kind of rainy. Walk around, and then you have, you're worried about your camera getting wet, and then you just it's it's nice to be. I love to be alone. It's 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 really it's a nice thing of of burning and of, of, of this thing, I think. When, when I, to, to add to that, I, I find that I'm more social when I'm shooting around New York City mm -hmm. area. And when I travel, that's the time when I really concentrate a lot more and I like to, to be by myself. I think Although uh, one thing is for me, like before before I moved to Brooklyn like five, six years ago, I was kind of more, <laughs> uh, not not a real good birder, but, but ambitious, but not really. But in Brooklyn, for example, there's the Brooklyn Bird Club walks Tuesday and Thursday. And that's a great way to know where to go mm -hmm. and to learn all about it. And that's kind of so, this, the group thing is a great thing too, right? It's like you, you go to a bird club walk, you have like some guy, some Stevenson or some, whoever it is, two talks, he knows deeply what he's talking mm -hmm. about and you know where to go. So that, that can be a nice, sure. thing, a nice thing. Sure, well. sure, sure, sure. Let me ask well, maybe the last question before a break, yeah, but yeah. In, in the urban setting, is there a, a separate group of photographers that like to kind of include that aspect of it, that these are birds... So therefore, the background will be a, a building or you know something very urban, or and then the other so want to separate that idea and maybe fake the fact that uh, yes, yeah, there are some who who are urban photographers, a yeah. couple I can think of, mm -hmm. and I I personally don't do it, even though my dream shot actually is like, which I haven't gotten yet, is a a flock of pigeons with, with a nice building background. That's a shot I've always wanted, wow. just that yeah. I haven't haven't tried it yet actually but <laughs> you know it's in my head somehow the, the the great thing for us is really that that uh right you travel all the way to the to the to, to the woods whatever go to canada wherever and you don't get so many birds as you get here i, I love certain shots that i have of uh, a bird on a on the water let's say on the reservoir it's actually the harlem mirror and the reflection of the water is like this weird red and it's from some traffic cone or construction cone that's totally unnatural you get these and it happens a lot of times where you get these weird reflections from from urban decay <laughs>
Okay, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to talk about gear and locations for bird photography. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. We are back. Let's start talking about equipment. Um, what's the, uh, first of all, cameras, you could, wh- wh- where do you go with cameras? What do you guys use? I'm, I used, for a lot of photos I did was 7D, the first one, and then a 5D Mark III. So you're a Canon man. Canon man, yeah. What about I, yourself, Dave? I, I've been a Canon person for 30 years. So okay. Ever since I was a teenager. So I started with a Canon AE-1, and now I have a Canon 1DX2 and a Mark 5D Mark IV, and a little, um, what, what is that? The little tiny Rebel um, that they just came out with, the new one. I don't the T7i? TD, TD. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I have that for right. little snapshots. And what, about, what about lenses now? Uh, what, obviously, I'm assuming that your 15 millimeter lens is going to be useless, okay? So we're talking telephotos, right? I, I have everything. You have everything. <laughs> well, let's, okay, I'm not going to forget my assumptions. Talk <laughs> no, to us no, about uh, it. Well, what do you use? Uh, well, well, you can start on, on, the, on the big edge. I have a, a 600, a 500, um, a 300, 2.8. And th- those are the main birding lenses. And then... Now, what kind of a mule do you have to carry all this around? <laughs> oh, it's me. <laughs> your kids. <laughs> but I, I've, I've moved away from carrying the big stuff around in, in, New, York, in New York City parks. I'll carry the 300 28 with me with a, with a 2X teleconverter. And I'll handhold that in the park now. Mm. Um, if, I'm, if I'm going out for the day and the car is close by. I'll take the, I'll, <laughs> so I'll, I'll, has, I'll take the has, has the recent technology of the VR, the ISO, and, and even more the high res, has that changed things to the point that you're comfortable cropping in yeah. a way you didn't used to be? And, Co- correct. Yeah, yeah. And especially with the 5D4. It's yeah. incredible. Um, yeah. And it, it preserves the detail with, with, with little noise. And That's one of the cheating things, that I, if you want to call it cheating. But I, I mean, I have a Sony and A7R2, and it's 42 something. And I find that I, I don't necessarily need the ultra long lens. I could use a shorter lens, crop into the frame, and still have a very good image file left. Correct. That's what I love about that. Correct. And, and, yeah. And it's not cheating. I mean, it's it's been done throughout oh, no, history, thing is, you know, right? There's always somebody who's going to be listening and saying, you crop pictures, you're going to hell. You know, and, <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, there are some people that really have a problem about cropping. I say, no, I, I have, have a problem, problem for myself. Do you really? Oh, you're totally. one of them? I say, no, I don't I don't crop. <laughs> That's right, you don't. But for, for me, it's like, for me, I have this weird Protestant idea, maybe, that art needs to have some level of sacrifice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so divorce is like to carry around... Around my around my neck, right? To carry around a, a 5D Mark III plus 800 millimeter lens, yeah. Canon plus 1.5 extender, and in a backpack, <laughs> a spotting scope, maybe or not, but just like or the binoculars around. So it's really, I actually ended up uh, having my 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 pinky asleep for half a year because I, <laughs> I think I got myself yeah. nerve damage from yeah. carrying. Oh, it's definitely. Like, this shoulder, is heavy shoulder. gear we're talking. I do, you go out in the morning, you don't eat, you don't drink, you don't give a shit, right? You just get going and you have this thing around your neck and you keep going till the sun goes away and then you say, oh, now we can stop. Well, you know, t- talking about the weight <laughs> though, I'm, just just five or six years ago, the, the, the can or whatever, seven years ago, the, the, this Canon 600 millimeter was like 12 pounds. I mean, that thing was a beast. And now it's down to like eight, eight and a half yes. pounds. Yes, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Ho- hopefully coming will be the, the 600 DO, which will probably, you know, be like... But you said you have a 500 and a 600. What would, right. what would well, it was facilitate weight, it using was, one or the other? It was weight um, okay. and, and travel. Mm. Sometimes um, there are weight restrictions on, on planes and the one pound can make a difference. I can handhold a 500 millimeter lens if I'm doing flight shots, for example, for, for a whole day, a lot more than I can with, with the 600. So, um, but if the 600 millimeter DO comes out next year, which is diffractive optics, it shrinks the lenses down and reduces what, the weight there's greatly. There's a 400 that they have. What, 400. A one to 400 DO, they have, I think? No, they have a one to 400, and then they have a 400 DO F4. Right. And, and they're tiny and light. They yeah. really are. So if they come out with the 600 like that, with mm-hmm. that formula, then I'll, I'll rid myself of the 6 and the 500. But but other lenses that I personally own, I I I, went, I tried macro for a little bit, so I mean, wasn't really that into it. But I still have 
those oh, 100 millimeter macro and that really Canon makes a specialized lens that's really fantastic. I think it's called the MPE4 or 5 or something. It's just this push-pull macro. It's a really incredible lens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then I, I, I like to take pictures of my kids and I've done kid shots and other things before in corporate shots. So I love my 85 1.2 and my 50 1.2. And Now, you mentioned fast lenses. Birds, like most wildlife, you want to be able to get early morning, late afternoon. That's when they're feeding. That's when they're most active. Um, and that also means lower light levels. What's the slowest aperture lens you'd recommend for anybody who is, say, listening to the show, they want to stop playing around? Where's your cutoff? Because we can buy some terrific, like, 18 to 300 millimeter zooms, but at the 300 millimeter range, they may not be useful. I think the real, if you want to do serious bird photography or serious photos, the real cheapest and slowest lens is the 400 millimeter 5.6. Non-image stabilized Canon lens, thousand four hundred bucks new, and you buy it used for seven hundred or whatever. That's a real. That's right. That's a real. Yeah, photo I, lens. I, I had it, but it it just if uh, it's it's really only good if you're for flight photography. I mean, in, in my opinion, I never you, use it, but everybody. Says if, it. if you, <laughs> <laughs> I love the lens. I never use it. But it's great. <laughs> but I have the, free, the same as you have. The, I have a very old banged up. It's just like wonderful. Imagine a lens, a three hundred millimeter lens, two point eight. But it's not. Im it's like super heavy. It's like 15 years old, and the the front lens is scratched, and it looks like really badass when you have it. But people don't even talk to me when I walk for a park. Mm. And it's a, it's really I like that. That's, that's it's kind of nice. But I think 300 millimeter 2.8. Spent a few thousand dollars, and that's the lens. You I highly recommend everything. that. It's a that's it's a, a beautiful lens. And you need in get the two teleconverters, the 1.4 and the 2x, to 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 pair with it. And as we mentioned before. You know, you can do quite nicely with the Sigma and Tamron make their lenses that go up to 6.3. You can do quite— And 6, 6.3 is still usable? You, with the with the camera technology Because now, we have high ISOs? High ISOs, okay. you, can, you can do pretty well. I wouldn't recommend a 7—I uh, wouldn't shoot them necessarily in low light with a cropped camera because of the noise. Even a 72, the noise would just be— What about autofocus? That was my concern. I know that we could bump ISO, but still autofocus— in many cameras, you get past five, six, f eight, you, it, it starts getting balky, and in true. some cases, just craps out altogether. It's not there. Shoot gulls in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> the pigeons, <laughs> pigeons. There, 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 there's, there's always, there's always a, there's always a subject. But you're right. If, if, if you're going for an action shot and you have that set up in low light, you're not going to do well. Gotcha. Hmm. Okay. If, if, but again, you know, we talked about that very first question. It's what you consider a good photo. And and for some people, it's just a even an out of focus image that looks like the bird is is successful. To well, them. you know, I think also <laughs> you might have be shooting at say a slower shutter speed, one that won't freeze the action. But if you understand your equipment and you and you're you're tuned to the movements of your subject, you can pan with a bird and get images where there could be a lot of blur and chaos, but one or two spots that are in focus enough to make it a very dynamic That's, photograph. It, not everything has to be razor sharp. I love that. I have some photos with 180 for the second they, they exposure, are, and they really, they, they, I love them. There is, there is always, there is some, right, there is some shake. But that's also a reason to, to shoot continuous shutter, because if you really have, your, if you are in the wrong place, right, you have like, you expose 100, mm -hmm. you have a 600 millimeter lens, and if you hold the camera as still as you can and you do 15 photos, one actually might be almost sharp. I, I, I reckon, I think he's a Brooklyn photographer. Um, his name is Johann Schumacher. And he shoots at about a fifth of a second. And he gets these incredible blur shots. So um, it's a whole other way of viewing birds and bird photography. But if you, if you get a chance, Google him and look up his stuff. It's, it's, quite, it's quite good. And, and Clemens, what, what's your lens set up? What do you usually carry when you go out and birding? Yeah, the 800 millimeter lens are sold mm, because uh, I needed money. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and the good over. thing is, you like, when you buy a lens, actually you can sell it quite well. Yeah. So yeah, it's better can, than a car. They're, they're great. They're so great investments. So if you spend nine thousand yeah. dollars, you might get eight thousand back, and then oh, you paid twenty thousand for two years. So it's so so it's a so what I carry now is really uh, I have also have like tilt and shift lenses. I have 100 millimeter macro, but for birds, there's only. I carry only one. I carry my banged up 300 millimeter 2.8 plus two times extender, which already gives me the kind of not perfect sharpness because already two times the, the optical magnification is great. I have 600 millimeter, and uh, 
And it's tough with the 5D because the 7D was is a crop factor, so you have a bigger bird, mm. and I don't crop, right? So it was nice. Now with the 5D, you have to get even closer because the, the bird has more space around it. So it, so I do that most most of the time, and it's a uh, get it's the fun. new 300, and you won't have any problem with the 2X. Oh, it, the, it's razor. It's still razor. But that would be too light, so that would be too easy. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's really. <laughs> I think the, the well, you know, have you, a lens is like it's like a it's like a dinosaur of power. Dave, what do you use for support? And um, I I do both mm -hmm. handhold, and I use a really right stuff. Um, I have two a small tripod and a, and a big tripod. Yeah. I don't know the model numbers, but right, okay, really right. And stuff. I use um, a gimbal head. You do a okay. Wimberly. Um, nice, okay. yeah. And on the small one, I have a. I think I'm using a. Don't use it that often, but it's a small Wimberly, a sidekick maybe. Yeah. I have to, I use different. I have to say, I'm yeah. very. I never. I don't use it, but I'm very proud of it. I think they're really cool. <laughs> so I have the Jitsu usual thing, the, the heaviest mm -hmm. one, without a with a, a structural head, and then I have a Sachtler 20. <laughs> it's, it's kind of heavy like hell. I use it mostly for the scope, spotting scope, but it would be perfect for photography. But I never, I never did any photos. But I now I carry this whole. Now I have the camera and carry the. The spotting scope around on my it's it's terrible on my shoulders with the with the with this heavy heavy uh, Sackler fluid head but it's fun it's like really fun when you look for it I'll, I'll tell you though the, the equipment and being a photographer I mean I was I used to be really into it and then in my little office in my apartment this past weekend I had I have these green storage boxes with crap in it and I just must have thrown out three out of the five box. I'm like, I haven't looked at this piece of, I haven't used this in 10 right. years. What do I need it for? Guess and what? just yeah. the amount of stuff that you accumulate. I mean, the amount of camera, I've almost tried every single camera bag there is. Yeah. And you talk about- You too? <laughs> every, everything. <laughs> and then, and, and this, and support and straps. And, you know, I've tried 80 different ball heads and 15 different gimbal heads. And it's just, it's just did, an, did enough Did you know already. that we have 14 aisles of bags just down the street? <laughs> you might want to stop yeah, by. Yeah, I, I, I think I've, <laughs> I think I've been to, I think I've bought them all. Well, what have you settled on? What's your bag now? Um, I use this for just when I'm carrying the 300 and walking around the, the park, I use a, a crumpler. I mm -hmm. think it's a $7 million bag. And then I think I have an F-stop backpack that's mm. that's that's pretty cool too and then my my main my major one which i really love this brand is think tank yeah so mm -hmm. i have a think tank wheeler and that thing is really stood up to travel that thing is crumplers amazing crumplers are made very very i own a few of them they they yeah i they have my crumpler forever. bag for a, for a long time you know we've been talking still photography here and and birding is birding is associated with stills Either of you guys shoot video, or, or are there any more? Are there birds shooting video? Oh, I, I imagine there are, but I no do. one hears about it. I do video. I tried video very hard, and I tried video to make an art video piece about birds. I think that still <laughs> photography is hard enough, and video is not easy. Um, and especially the editing of video is a lot harder to do than oh, yeah. than, than a single shot and, and Photoshop. And as as a, a person who somewhat attempts to sell the picture, there's no market for your video. So it's it's that's really just a personal personal pleasure just to to, to look at it. So mm. I don't have the time to to mess around with that. I almost wish they would remove the video from from the cameras. But there is but there's a nice thing about video from a birding perspective. When you see like photos trick you, right? They don't really show the bird. Like my photos, the birds look very much slimmer than they are, really. But if you look at a video, in 20 seconds, you really have a feeling you know this bird. It might not be that sharp, but you see how the bird moves, for example. With the photos, you're always like, you, you, you have to, every photographer picks certain, certain particular moments, which he likes or doesn't like. Isn't that true of every photograph, though? Uh, no, yes. but the video. They're all if, little snaps of no, time but, that don't exist, really. But if you want to know a bird, a video is, is very valuable. And one nice thing for for a fellow birder is if somebody takes a video, there's no shadow. But just the video, it's quiet. Are there any <laughs> other pieces of gear that we don't we don't think of that are kind of essential to your kit? Cars. Well, no. get I where think, you need to go. Yeah. I think the the proper clothing uh, yeah. is really important. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah um, you're spending so much time you know, time not not as much when you're in New York City, but right. when you're out in the field, especially with Covering yourself up with ticks, mm -hmm. um, having a great a great um, shell is really important. Um, zip off mm -hmm. zip off pants are like mm -hmm. a godsend. 
Man. Any any need to the camouflage your camera and your gear? Or do um, you do that? Yeah, or, I do. Yeah, yeah. I, I use the lens coats. You do. Um, yeah. That are the, the camo. Is Whether that for they work us or is that for the birds? Really, so seriously. It's, it's completely for the, the person to make them look better. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, 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 the main thing really is if it keeps your equipment in great shape. That's and true because you, you there's resale, a lot of mix and bangs. And on, yes. on resale, you're you're making up the cost of the the lens code a, a thousand times. A lens I code never, really I never, is cheap. Insu- it's cheap insurance. Cheap policy. insurance. Um, I never do that because I think it's it just this gray military color looks so cool. I want to look <laughs> cool still when I walk around. That, that, um, what about monopods? Uh, we we were talking about that earlier and. Are they usable? Are they practical? What do you what you take on that? Not practical. If, if, you, if you're going to be out in the field all day, you're going to be holding that monopod constantly. If you have a tripod, you can set your equipment down, give yourself a break. Um, with a monopod, you're you're just wedded to your equipment. If you're hand holding, you can have your camera on a strap and still have it on you. So it's very difficult to maneuver with your equipment hold, having a monopod all day. Plus, the support isn't that great. If you're carrying, if you're holding it, I mean, it's not like you're a sports photographer shooting at four thousandth of a second all the time in, in, in a controlled lighting setting, and then you could put your camera down on the sideline. Um, it, it, it's just I don't think it's practical. It's, what's what's a monopod? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how about it's a, a third, how a third a selfie of a, stick? <laughs> yeah, a third of a tripod. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and any kind of tricks of the trade when you're handling these big lenses? Anything that you you do or you've learned to do to save your back or, or keep your stability? I've, yeah. Well, hand, the first time you use a large tel- telephoto lens is, is a learning experience. I mean, spe- when you have a lens on a support, it's it's, it's different. But mm-hmm. but you have to learn how to. Balance and hold hold the lens. Get the proper balance on your gimbal or, or your, your ball whole body is part of the show. Yes, y- your breathing because uh-huh. everything is magnified it um, tremendously. So the littlest vibration. So you kind of try to tamp down on your lens. Um, it becomes second nature a- after a while. But there's a, there is a, a learning curve. Now also there is a benefit to heavy equipment when it comes to this because the weight in your hands actually steadies you. You have it's one true, of these yeah, lightweight yeah. little, you know, entry level DSLRs and the new flopping all over the place. It, it actually, yeah, it's great. You have all this in a light package, but it's actually harder to hand hold that. Also, like to find the bird fast in your in your in your viewfinder. That's a that's a real that's real fun to learn and to get better. And there's some people are really good. I think my thing is always I think the best way to to be successful is to do it a lot, obviously, right? So yeah, experience and then to. To do continuous shutter, which some people don't don't do, but to continuous shutter, which is the, the best best chance to get something, and then just shoot the hell out of it, and then spend two hours at home to look for all the photos. <laughs> so it's a fun. You might find a new bird you didn't see before. Learn learn your equipment. That's oh, the first yeah, thing. Yes. The yeah. first thing you should do. Yeah. I don't necessarily read my manual anymore, but when when I first started, I read the, actually read them. They're so confusing, but yeah. they, there are some good tidbits in there. But talk to people. Um, Look for advice, seek out advice. Do you and use uh, do you use GPS? Do you take notes? Do you use geotagging? It's all or in my head. It's all up there. Okay. I mean, yeah. you, almost any picture on my website, I could tell you where I took where it. You took it. Yeah, that's good. I one. used to be able to tell you on my the four thousand birds I've seen. I used to be able to tell you where I saw, saw each bird, but I can't do that anymore. Uh-huh. No, no more bandwidth and, for that. And <laughs> vibration reduction is always on, or always, always yeah. even on the tripod. Yeah, because um, so, sometimes they say that you should. I mean, back in the first iterations of Im- well, there's a image. tripod mode, right? But I think if anyone's listening to this, if you depending on your camera, some cameras you have to turn it off if you're on a tripod, or you'll wreck the mechanism. Not, not on the Canons. In my experience, and all the photographers who I know keep it on, like I think it's setting too. I'm not, mm-hmm. We're not worried about okay, it. Okay, but mm-hmm. check with in there is a bit of yeah. You should you should check check with yes. your manual. Uh, um, no, let's I'm not, not assume. I'm not. And gonna, also, uh, your camera might be okay, but say there's a lens system that is using it. You got to make sure the lens is compatible with that. Too, re- read so. your manual. Read your manual. Do you ever go out with two bodies? Like to have one with the wide angle for. I oh, used to. Yeah. No, well, I, would, I would carry a 600 and a yeah, 300, I, but uh-huh. I don't do that anymore. I only go with two bodies, my body and the and camera the body. <laughs> <laughs> good one. <laughs> do, you, do, do either one of you ever bait the scene, like leave a dead goat there or something like that, hoping that somebody good will come along? I, I won't do that, but see, <laughs> seeds. Um, I've held nuts up for jays and things like that to, to get them in, in a certain spot. What um, are some of the I'm ready for regarding that. If the ivory gal ever, ever comes to Brooklyn, I'm ready to, to, to drop a whole stripe as there, but uh, it didn't come. Yeah, yet. I mean, the, 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 pe- pe- people feed feed birds 
Well, it's uh, yeah, pelagics are just a feeding, a feeding frenzy. You'd feed birds, so there's kind of there's some things that are not so natural, but it's still fun. That's how how you what? How you have fun. People don't look down on that, like in the birding community of of kind of drawing birds. Pe- to people you. love bird feeders. I don't. Yeah, it's, yeah. you know, it's yeah. it's not like it, you're overfeeding them. Yeah. Even, it's not like I carry worms around with yeah. me. What fascinates you about birds? Either of you is that a. I think I, I think it's the whole the whole experience. I mean, I love going out in nature and and um, I love the singing. I love the colors. I think they're fascinating. As Clemens mentioned before, during migration, just the thought of these little things flying thousands of miles um, is is just just truly fascinating. Uh, their behavior is fascinating, and they're they're it kind of brings a smile to your face when you might not feel like smiling. And would you continue birding at this point, even if you weren't taking photos? Um. Less so than, um, but it's still it's it's a release, so it's 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 fantastic. And you have a good chance to right. If you would photograph mammals, it would be deadly boring to go to Central Park to photograph (laughs) (laughs) five species of mammals. But with birds and also (laughs) insects, insects are but they're a bit hard, a bit more specialized. But birds just. uh, a wonderful opportunity. There are so many around. They have like a few hundred species you can get. They are beautiful. You can see them. They are common ones. So it's like if you walk out of this building and look up for one minute, you can see some kind of a bird flying by. So it's kind of they're they are so they're kind of the most beautiful, the most accessible nature after air. Yeah, they're ubiquitous. They're they're around. Any secret spots here in the city that you don't want to give up, but you will? Well, Clemens is Plum Beach is you know used to be secret until he started talking about it so much. <laughs> <laughs> I kept trying to go shh, stop. Uh, yeah. Floyd Bennett Field too is a huge place and it's got great things to look at d- d- no matter d- what. Different times of the year bring bring different things. Yes. So if, if Floyd Bennett Field this time of year when the little pools of water fill up on the asphalt is a great place for shorebirds. Mm. Um, Central Park in the Ramble or um, is great um, for for songbirds. Um, Any process. wetlands, you go to the one down to the shore because New York City, Long Island, New Jersey, well, it's coastal and that's where the birds are Plum, following a lot, Plum, right? Plum Beach is yeah. is great, has a little wetlands and, and, yeah. and a, a spot that's being birded more and more, which is something that New York City Audubon is working on, is Governor's Island. Mm-hmm. Um, there are a tremendous amount yeah, of species that are right. showing up there. It's, it's, it's a really nice place to go birding. What about around the country? Are there any uh, places that are really well known? amongst the birding community for, for birds? Well, a place in New Mexico called Bosque de la Pache. Um, it's, a, it's a great place in the winter to shoot uh, sandhill cranes and snow geese. It's very, very popular. Um, there's always a photo opportunity there. Um, that, that's the one that jumps off mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, the, the top of my head. Otherwise, you can go anywhere in any patch of woods and, and find, find birds. But um, lo- looking for a migrant trap, um, Big mm. Bend National Park is a, is a, is a great place oh, to shoot yeah? birds. Okay. Now, we have listeners all over the place. And it, it, say we have somebody's listening and they would like to f- learn a little bit more. What would be some of the sites to check out for local birding areas where you could just either just do birding or take pictures of birds? The internet has become a real great source. And eBird. Mm. So eBird? You, I yeah. would just say. Oh, okay. It's Cor- about it's Cornell else. University's. Go to eBird, put in your county. They didn't have hotspots. Ah, you have all kinds okay. of things. Then you can check our eBird lists and look at these lists. And then you can, you really can take eBird and you can see where to go. Ah. Rare bird alerts. Every state has a rare bird alert that's that's um, online as well. Uh, I think it's now run by the, used to be run by the American Birding Association. Um, and that's a good place people put their sightings of rare birds up. Um, there are a few books that are very good. There are Lane series bird guides. I've, mm-hmm. I've found them to be excellent and get yourself a, a good map. Um, the obviously warm. being a, doing your research, knowing your birds always comes before right. photography. You know? Right. Are there Peterson field guides that make some, or yeah. some, that name yeah. seems to stand like out there's on my one head. About, uh, there's one, there's the standard ones, but then it's one about seabirding, right? A beautiful book. Are there any apps that are bird centric? For identifying birds, I know there are music yeah. things. You play one or two little notes, and it tells you what the song is and, and how many people recorded it. What about birds? Well, D- David David Sibley has his Sibley guide on online, which is quite good. And, and iBird Pro is one that a lot of people use. And plus, they have sounds, which we didn't discuss the ethics <gasps> ah. of, of playing bird calls. So, um, but the, is that cheating? 
it's not if you go anywhere <laughs> if you go anywhere around the world on on a birding tour the the guide will play the bird songs until the client sees a bird in the united states it's frowned on a, a little bit more um if you're the only birder or photographer in an area that's not heavily birded playing playing the tape once or twice is is not deadly but if you're in an area where it's concentrated with hundreds of birders and they play the same song over and over again, it definitely becomes detrimental to the bird. And pitching is a very, a very funny thing. It's like one is playing the bird songs, which is kind of a, there's, there's concerns about that, but one is pitching, which nobody has a concern about, which like, they do like, so yeah. a sparrow who is in the, who's in the bushes comes up to look where is, what's going on? Who is that idiot <laughs> who came? So if you want to see attract warblers or sparrows or certain birds, you pitch. You can really, so if, really, if you walk through the woods and hear somebody saying, it's very annoying. And then the sparrow, <laughs> and then the sparrows come out with little cameras and take pictures of the people doing that, right? Yeah. They look so, what are these guys doing? Oh, but, there's another human here. I hear them. But like black and white warblers, they almost started flying onto me when I was fishing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think when you do anything like this, you need to be considerate to the people that might be around, as well as you know mostly thinking about the birds. And there you go. Everything we needed to know about birding photography. Yeah, we scratched the surface there. Okay, David Spizer, your work can be found at? www.lilybirds.com, L-I-L-I-B-I-R-D-S.com, named after my oldest daughter, Liliana. Ah, that was the question we didn't get to. Okay, got that. Did she right. bird with you? Um, she used to. I, I have better luck with the younger one, but at, the, at this point, I think to, ain't so cool. <laughs> yeah. I guess not. Yeah. Uh, anything about the Audubon, NYC Audubon? Is that the, oh, a site you can point us yeah, to? Yeah, uh, I'm not, I don't know the exact website. Uh, NYCAudubon.com, okay. org. But it has uh, great information about um, birding locations in New York City, mm -hmm. about um, the organization's environmental efforts. Uh, it's a very, if if you're visiting New York and you want to know where to go to bird, it's a great first step. Okay. Clemens, your work can be found at? My webpage is www, and then it's my name, clemensgasserstudio.com. Okay. Another show is wrapped. Remember to subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Leave a review. And do keep in mind, if you can't get enough of our show, check out the show notes on iTunes and on our b and Photography podcast landing page, where you can find notes about the show from John, photographs by our guests, and links to their websites, along with links to any products we might have mentioned during the course of the show. I'd like to thank you, David Spizer, Clemens Gossett. Thank, thank you. you both for stopping thank by. Thank you to Jason Tables and John. John Harris. To our listeners, as always, thank you so much for tuning in today.